Good morning and welcome. Welcome to those who are here and those who are Zooming in this morning. We have a, a few announcements that we'd like to highlight. Um, first of all, we've got a couple of the babies, two of the three that are going to be baptized next week. So Harmony's in the back and Colson's in the front. So they're just so cute. I just had to point them out. Um, we were blessed this week um, from our our brothers and sisters at the St. Andrews United Church in Niagara Falls. Let me read to you the little note we got. Reverend Martha and our extended family at Central United. We were devastated to hear about the destructive acts of vandalism visited upon your sacred worship space. For a place of shelter and refuge to be so violated must strike to the core. As you put things to rights and make repairs, please know that we are praying for you and offer this gift to help as it may. On behalf of your siblings at St. Andrews in Niagara Falls, Nancy Robinson, uh, Council Chair. Um, we received a check for $700 towards our, uh, and needless to say, well, they'll be getting a thank you from us. It just makes me feel good. See, that's the extended family of Christ. Um, tonight, we continue our Lenten um, movie series, and we're going to be seeing another documentary tonight um, called uh, Stonewall. Stonewall is like uh, Rosa Parks refusing to go to the back of the bus is what they consider the beginning of the civil rights movement, um, like Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan sitting in the Oak Room at the Plaza Hotel and refusing to leave a male-only dining room um, sparked the beginning of the women's rights movement. Um, Stonewall really was the historical uh, start of uh, the, the gay rights movement, and particularly it's what started um, pride parades. Uh, Michelle and I visited there uh, a number of years back when we were in New York. We felt we had to make a bit of a pilgrimage, but it really gives a lot of insight into how a group of people who are constantly being oppressed and treated unfairly will rise up to good things. So I encourage you, come 7 o'clock. The movie itself is only an hour and a half, so you'll still get home early, and we'll have a good debriefing. Um, our trivia night next Saturday, uh, if you didn't sign up, you're too late. We are sold out. So that's a great, uh, a great thing. And... Um, if you, have, if you have indeed uh, signed up and are ready to go, you might want to brush up on your United Church history because I hear there's a few United Church specific questions. Don't know what they are, but... And then finally, the most important thing that's happening next, set, next Sunday is we are baptizing three babies. And that is always a great time in the church. I love baptism Sundays because you never know what's going to happen, right? You never know if the kid's going to spit up on you, going to wail, but these three little angels, I think, will be fine. Um, as an opportunity to celebrate these baptisms, we also want to invite everybody to a potluck following the service. That means we'd appreciate if you, you're going to stay, we'd appreciate you bring either a main dish or a salad and maybe a little dessert. I'm not a dessert person, but I know there are people who have a sweet tooth. Um, and we rejoice together. Last time uh, when little Gwen was baptized, the uh, Spencer family very graciously invited us to be part of their celebration. They provided all the food. That wasn't really, I thought, I thought this time, okay, that's not fair, so let's, let's all uh, share with them. So tomorrow, prior to the service, just drop off your dishes in the, in the kitchen. We'll have folks, uh, the Randalls are organizing things, and uh, following the service, we'll celebrate together this um, benchmark on the spiritual journey of these beautiful little children. I believe those are all the announcements for this morning. Um, as we gather to worship God and share in the work of grace and justice, let us pause to remember that in this region we live and work and worship on lands that are by law, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all. As we are a global church, a worldwide church, we continue to pray for peace 
for peace in the Ukraine. And we light the candles of the colors of the Ukrainian flag. Let's pray. Oh God, we simply pray for peace this day. We think of the people who's, who have been displaced, who have lost loved ones, whose homes have been destroyed through no fault of their own. We think of the Russian soldiers who are sent, who don't believe in this war either, but feel they are compelled to go by their government. We pray that hearts and minds will be changed and that indeed peace will prevail and Ukraine can get back to being who they are, prosperous, hardworking, loving and community-minded people. And we pray these things in the name of the Prince of Peace. Amen. Let's read responsibly our call to worship. When the world is dark and full of hate and fear, when we cannot see God, when we cannot find our way back to love and peace, when our vision dims due to the darkness within, Christ, open our eyes with the gift of sight. Come and worship the one who brings sight to the blind. Let's follow the choir and look to the screen and sing together, Your Love is Amazing. Let's pray together. Gracious God, who created us in God's own image, we are grateful that all you have done for us, for all that you are doing in us, and for all that you will do through us. Open our eyes to see your presence among us, 
moving in powerful ways at all times and in all places. Open our ears to hear familiar words in new ways, ways that will change us and challenge us to become the people you created us to be. Granted us the power and the courage to come out of the darkness and into the light of Jesus Christ, that we may serve you by serving others. We love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. Aubrey and Hadley, come on down, or up. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Yeah, last time I saw you, I think, was Halloween, and it wasn't that long ago. You can come sit here. You were baptized, and now your little brother's going to be baptized next, uh, next week. How do you feel about your little brother? Good. Good? Do we give him a thumbs up? Okay. Wait till he gets older and start stealing your stuff, then might, your opinion might change. <laughs> Did you guys, at Christmas, remember we had all that snow? Yeah. Did you guys lose power? Did your lights go out at any time? Oh, you were lucky. You were lucky, because where I lived, and where your, your grandma Barbara lived, we lost yeah. power. Remember, you know your grandma Barbara, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, your great-grandma Barbara, I should say. Yeah, and now, if we turned out all the lights in this room, what, how would it affect us? If we turned out all the lights, including the screens and stuff, would it be harder to see? Yeah. Well. <laughs> Somebody from the peanut gallery made a comment back there. 
Um, are you ever scared in the dark? Yeah, dark, dark can be pretty scary when you can't see things. You can trip over. I'm only afraid what's in the dark. Ah, what's in the dark. Yes. Yeah. You don't dark. You like dark. Well, Jesus in the in the gospel today is going to talk about being the light of the world, and we reflect that light when we're positive, when we're kind to each other, when we put up with our little brother when he's miserable and crying, um, or our our sisters, when we. Um, Say a nice thing to others. Give a friend a hug when they need it. Those are all things that reflect Jesus' light. And it's always better when there's light on, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk to the adults about. I'm not sure what Michelle has in store for you, but I know it's about the journey to Easter. So I'm going to say a little prayer for you, and then you guys are off for Sunday school. Oh, God, thank you for Aubrey and for Hadley. Thank you for... Um, they're just, just sweet faces as they come here today. And, and I pray that you would speak to them and cement in their minds and hearts that you are the light of the world and it's always better when there's light. Bless them. Bless Michelle and Grayson. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, see you guys later. Follow Michelle. In our continuing, uh, in our continuing uh, process and journey of um, affirming, uh, we want to sh share stories. And stories from people in the LGBTQ community are important, but so are those who are allies. So we invite Wayne Miller to come and share his story of uh, enlightenment, I guess. <laughs> Wayne? <laughs> Good morning. Uh, so my journey to being an ally of the LGBTQ community started pretty rough. It started very rough, actually, because I think when I look back at my upbringing, which was, I think, you know, very blessed in some ways, coming from a very um, fairly happy home, I believe, uh, and being raised in, the, in a, 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 a Christian denomination that was supportive of each other, but not so supportive of, of everything else around it. In fact, um, most of the stories I would hear of anything that wasn't within the church community was stories of fear and stories of um, danger. And uh, I remember very early on uh, attending some services with my grandparents in a very rural area of Pennsylvania that Martha knows well. Um, and the evangelists would rail against uh, the sinners, and those sinners tended to be uh, members of the LGBTQ community, frankly, when I think back on those stories now. But at the time, it was, it was new, it was, it was strange, and I, I didn't know anyone who would identify uh, that way. So I started that way, and, um, and I think, um, again, you partialize, you partialize your life as to uh, what's okay and what's not okay. A university was... Um, a bit of a shot in the face for that because all of a sudden I was introduced to difference. Uh, difference uh, in terms of culture, difference in terms of ideas, uh, differences in terms of interests, and then also in terms of uh, sexual identity, sexual orientation. And uh, so I had to struggle with things. And, and being in uh, a social work program, I was confronted with um, thinking about how everybody comes with difference and how do we um, value diversity. And so that really flew in the face of everything I had been raised with so far, but I, I really liked what I heard. It, it intrigued me. My second year in university, I, I lived with, um, I roomed with a guy on residence who was student body president, most popular guy. He was incredible. He just had so many, he was, he was witty, um, sometimes a little, you know, cuttingly so, but still incredible sense of wit and sense of humor, and I just learned so much. The year after, he said, you know, we need to get together for coffee, so we did. And we got together for coffee, and he said, so I need to tell you, uh, you're going to hear this very quickly, uh, I'm, I've come out, I'm gay. And, um, you know, of course, my head is spinning, because I don't know what this means, what it means to have somebody I really admire, what does that mean in terms of, of um, our relationship, what does it mean in terms of you know, his faith and, and 
he took time. He took lots of time to say, okay, so I've been working through this. And it was also the time when uh, the Mennonite Church, which is uh, um, the sponsor of the, the college or the residence that I was part of, was also really struggling with this issue on a denominational um, uh, stage. So Rob was part of that and part of that discussion. And I learned so much about, um, again, not equating um, sexual orientation with, with good and bad, but, and not equating it as choice, which I think was the thing that really was different from what I was told, right? Um, growing up, it was all about we make choices. We make choices to be good. We make choices to be bad. So if somebody has, you know, made, you know, if somebody is doing something that we don't agree with, then therefore they've made that choice. I think that was the place where I really thought, oh, I gotta do something with this thought because it's not helpful anymore. Um, after graduation, I went on to work uh, with uh, an organization, a provincial organization called Hemophilia Ontario. And it was working with families whose, um, whose family members had hemophilia. Hemophilia, if you don't know it, is a blood disorder where somebody is not able to clot as easily. And so they have uh, issues with uh, bleeding um, you know, whether it's internal or external, but they need a clotting factor um, that they would receive. But this was the uh, mid-80s, and at that time we were just finding out that the blood supply which provided that factor had been um, tainted with HIV. And so these families were starting to find out that their children, their husbands, their boyfriends, uh, and, you know, members themselves were HIV positive. So my job was to, again, 23 years old, didn't have a clue really looking back, but to look at helping and providing support to these families. But what it did also is it, is it allowed me to get involved with um, HIV organizations all throughout the province, which meant I was meeting with members of the LGBTQ community, working with them, working alongside of them, um, being challenged by them, being inspired by them, and again, having to shift those old ideas and say that doesn't fit anymore, that good, bad stuff, that decision, that choice doesn't fit anymore. So what do I do with that? And that was, that was a pretty important uh, couple years. I went to grad school after that and had a number of my classmates who were members of the LGBTQ community. And again, so much in common and so um, inspired by uh, them uh, meeting their partners, realizing that their relationships were not that different. We're not different at all. Um, than the relationships that I was in or the people around me uh, that were heterosexual and heterosexual relationships uh, were as well. So that was important. For me, it was all about putting names and faces to those ideas. Um, we have a, 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 some, some language that we use sometimes in social sciences about othering. And the other is when we look at another group and we can push them off and, and denigrate them because they're not us. And so for me, putting names and faces and relationship to these uh, people was a way of de-othering, of getting rid of that other term, and they were, they were me. They were, they were friends of mine. They were people that I related to. And you know, somehow those doors kept opening for me that I kept being uh, able to walk through and work um, in areas and get to know people. Uh, from the LGBTQ community. I worked in an HIV care program for a year and saw people who were um, living with a chronic illness, but more importantly and, and more often, people that were dying from HIV and watching them and their partners struggle with the ways in which they were ostracized uh, because of their sexuality and looking at stigma and, and, and how do we deal with stigma. And that was, that was powerful um, to see even in the face of their dying, they were, ha they were having to deal with these things. So many years later, after you know, living in many different parts of, of Ontario and uh, parts of the states and, and coming in contact with uh, you know, members of the LGBTQ community, getting to know them, getting to work with them, I now have members in my own family um, who are LGBTQ. And I couldn't be prouder. And, and, and again, it's all about relationship. It's all about getting to know them, getting to get rid of these ideas of, you know, these, um, these awful images that have been put in my, in my mind uh, very early on. 
And so now as, you know, my brother-in-law is gay, as my, one of my children uh, uh, feel they uh, call themselves part of the LGBTQ community. Um, these are in things that are important to me. And I find myself challenged all the time to say what gets in the way of my loving, what gets in the way of my um, accepting and being inclusive. And so, you know, I have the chance to be part of the affirming committee. It's like, it's just a natural step for me uh, because I believe it. Do I still struggle with those old ideas that come up every time, every now and again? Of course, because they were ingrained and they were deeply ingrained. And so I've had to do some of that work to look through, uh, to look through the Bible and look at those clobber passages that we're going to talk about in a month. Um, to look through some of that and say, what do I do with this stuff that I've been taught? And uh, again, I keep coming back to the, to the loving nature of Christ, and the inclusive nature of Christ, and uh, the strength of that. And that has it's made all the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for your honesty and your, your sharing, and I'm sure that resonates with a lot of folks here. We want to take some time to pray for, um, pray for those who are struggling. After I, after I left uh, the church last Sunday, I went to Port Coburn Hospital to visit Dave Bowman, and bless his heart, the first thing he said to me was, what needs fixing at the church? I asked him if he had any expertise in in uh, stained glass, and he said, nope, that's beyond my pay scale. Um, in, his, in his last hours of life, Dave, Dave passed away last Sunday night, uh, early Monday morning, so we want to remember his family and just the giving and generous man that he was. Let's pray together. Oh God, thank you for um, those you bring into our lives, those who are here to serve and to give. And we think of the Bowman family. We think of Dave's partner, Christina, and his two daughters who are grieving his loss. We thank you for his kindness to this church, his friendship with the Swick family, and uh, his willingness to always do what he could to help make sure the church runs smoothly. Lord, we pray that you would walk with his family in their grief, and they would sense the comfort of your spirit knowing that Dave has left this world, but is in the presence of God, cancer-free, whole, and perfect. We pray for others who are grieving the loss of loved ones and pray that they will experience the same kind of comfort, uh, that knowledge deep in, in our souls that everything's going to be okay and that our loved one is in a far better place. Even in times, we wish they were still here with us. Oh God, we pr pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, for the church in areas where there's persecution. And we think of, of Ukraine, and we think of other places where just for meeting together like we do, so freely and so easily, their lives are truly at risk. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are in this general area, and while we lament that our churches aren't bursting at the seams like they were in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we are bigger than we think we are, and we pray for Grace United in, in Dunville. We thank you for um, Pastor Werner and the leadership there, a bright spot in that community for so many years. We pray that they would continue um, their ministries there with strength, with confidence, but mostly with the love of Jesus Christ. We pray for all those who are facing um, things like cancer treatments and surgeries and maybe healing from them. We thank you for the, um, the good outcome uh, that Ron Swick had this week with his surgery in St. Catharines, and we pray for complete healing that uh, he'll be able to go home soon from Welland. Pray for Irene as she um, supports him and cares for him and, and John and the rest of his kids. Lord, we pray for all those on our list 
and those who aren't on our list that need your prayers. And it might be difficulty with marriage or difficulty with um, family members. It might mean healing of past hurts. It might be healing of the body. Whatever the need is, oh God, you know and you can attend. Lord, we pray for our government. We thank you that we live in a democracy, and as much as we may grouse about our elected officials, indeed, we are blessed because we live in a place where voices are heard, and we ultimately have the power when we go to vote. We pray for our prime minister, for our premier, for the chair of our region, for our mayor and council. All these people who make decisions on our behalf, we pray that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them compassion and creativity and good stewardship. Bless them, O oh God, and help us to be mindful of praying for them, as, at least as much as we criticize them. O oh God, we thank you again for this great fellowship that has come together. We ask, O oh God, that you would unite us, that you would help us to be of one mind as we look forward to the ministry you will do through us here in Welland. And as we think of coming together, we pray the prayer that brought us together. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's look in our hymnals or to the screen and sing together, O Worship the King.
old adage tells us it is more blessed to give than to receive. And how good it makes us feel to give so that we may change and impact a person's life on the positive. So we thank you for your gifts, whether they be taken through PAR, through e-transfer, through envelope giving. Um, let's pray together. Gracious God, as followers who are blinded by your wondrous light, we seek to be amplified beacons of your astonishing light to others. Help us to reflect your love by listening to your call and your will for our lives. In gratitude, we dedicate these gifts in the name of the one who lived, died, and rose for our sake, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture readings this morning come from John chapter 9, starting at verse 1 through 5. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who has sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And we continue with verses 26 through 41. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are his fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know what, that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opens my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening eyes of a blind man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when they found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Christmas 2022 will go down in my personal history as the Christmas the lights went out. Actually, they went out on the 23rd in the afternoon and didn't come back until about 8.30 on Christmas night. Daytime wasn't too bad, though we lacked heat. We do have a gas stove so we could cook a hot meal, make tea and hot chocolate. And as optimistic as I generally am, it kind of got to me. Church services were canceled. The probably, I won't say most important, but the most excitement, I mean, that's like our Super Bowl, Christmas and Easter. Christmas services were canceled on Christmas Eve. The wind howled like I have never heard it howl before. Cell service was inconsistent and Wi-Fi didn't even exist. We couldn't see family on Christmas Day, and for Michelle, that was doubly hard because she didn't get to see her kids or her mom. At night, we were reduced to candlelight and a transistor radio to hear what was going on in the world. And really, the best news we got was from Buffalo, so it didn't even really apply to our situation. It was a cruel joke after two COVID Christmases and the limitations that had been put on us. And then, at about 8.30 on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, Christmas night, the lights came on. 
we immediately felt a sense of warmth, even though the house was still pretty cold. We could see in the downstairs, get a more accurate picture of the storm and its destruction. I almost cried with Thanksgiving. I probably did. Light is important to us humans. It affects our mood. Too much prevents us from a good night's sleep. And too little can lead to depression and seasonal affected disorder. I heard on the radio the other morning that this has been the grayest winter in eight decades. That's a long time. Light is necessary for our very survival, but also for our mental well-being. In the gospel passage that Lori read, actually one of, the, one of the scriptures that she didn't read, but is in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John, Jesus describes himself as the light of the world. That's one of the I am passages. So today we're going to consider how we encounter the light and how we reflect the light of Jesus. Now, I'm going to see how strong your survival skills are. And I'm going to give you this scenario. You're in a plane flying over the desert, and as you're sitting near the cockpit, you hear the captain give his coordinates to the tower at 1,500 hours. Half an hour later, however, the plane crashes in an uninhabited part of the desert in which only the only vegetation is a few cactus trees. But before the plane crashes, you hear the captain sending off an SOS message to the tower, and you hear them reply, but you can't make out what they've said. The plane crashes, but no one, no one is hurt. But the radio is totally destroyed, and it looks like the plane is going to explode in a few minutes. In the plane, there are only 10 things that you can see that you can take out of the plane, but you can only take three of them. What three items would best ensure your survival and why? Marcus, the list? You have one minute to look over this list and in your mind decide what you're going to take. Go. are taking this seriously. Wow. OK, time. I'm going to ask the choir first. I always feel bad I've got my back to them. Uh, what three would you take? A knife? It's a, it's a private charter, so it's a little different. Salt tablets, the bottle of water. OK, how about out here? Pa the mirror? The mirror? I heard parachute over here. Compass, first aid. <laughs> Probably not. Okay, anybody else? It's it's got a it's got a what do they call that finish? Brush finish or matte finish? There we go. Any anything else? Well, the answer according to U.S. military's top survival expert, was as follows. The third most important item was the knife, because it can be used to cut the cacti to, provo to provide drinking water. The second most important item was the parachute, because once the plane blows up, you have no shelter from the sun. And number one, the most important item is the lady's mirror because you can use it to reflect the sun and so attract the attention of any plane sent out to look for you. I think you can also build a fire with it if you, 
yeah. Uh, so, so what you might ask, what does this have to do with Jesus' words in today's story, I am the light of the world? Well, I'd like to suggest that we as members of the church are like the mirror. If Jesus is the, is the sun that illuminates the world, we are the little mirrors that God calls us to reflect Jesus' glory in the world. Picture, picture, if you will, a disco ball. After all, the Bible teaches us that we are made in God's own image. With that in mind, you can think of ways in which we can reflect Jesus into our dark world. First of all, we can reflect the light of Jesus in this world by sharing the love of Jesus to those around us. We do this when we host um, a Harvest Kitchen, when we host Drop-In, when we support Open Arms and other organizations. Any time we do something to invite others and meet a need they may have, we reflect Jesus and the light comes on and it's always better when there's light. Another way we can reflect the light of Jesus in this world by sharing the good news that Jesus has come to reconcile us to God through his death on the Christ on the cross. And that's coming up in a few weeks, our, again, if you will, Super Bowl, our Easter Sunday. You remember the words of the Great Commission found at the end of the book of Matthew? Go and make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We don't need to be shy about identifying why we do what we do. Jesus loved us and loves us, and we reflect that love. We do the good things we do, not because we're great people, but because it's a natural reflection of the light that Jesus has shone into our lives. If we are raised with kindness and generosity, there's a good chance that we will be kind and generous people. As Jesus has brought light into our lives, as he, as he did the man born blind, we must tell others the source of that light and not be shy about it. Because if we have the answer, why don't we want to share it with other people? A third way we can reflect the light of Jesus in this world is by showing the world how God wants us to live, by the church living harmoniously together. Do you remember what the early church was like from Acts 2? Peter had just been preaching, and the scripture records this. They, meaning the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with, with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And God ended, added to their number daily, those who were being saved. This church in Acts 2 had the whole ancient world buzzing within 50 years of his founding, and within 300 years, it had turned the civilized world upside down. It wasn't just a, a Sunday church. They lived together, shared meals in each other's houses during the week. They had house groups together, one of the reasons we get together, we're going to have a potluck next Sunday, is so we can be together, celebrating this milestone of these families' faith journeys, celebrating these beautiful little babies that someday will grow up and one of them might end up being your minister or my minister, sharing a meal together, just enjoying being together and being with one another. Just like Michelle and I missed our families on Christmas and Boxing Day, over the past two years, we have missed a lot of times of being together. Social events, Easter breakfasts, 
and all the things we do as a faith community, as a family of believers. The light of Christ that we reflect is attractive. People want to be where the light is. It builds them up. Every summer, many of you are willing to drive all the way to Crystal Beach for a barbecue that Michelle and I host. And it's not because I have exceptional grilling skills. I can cook. None of these had gotten sick that I know of anyway. <laughs> but we just love being together. And in a world where we can be increasingly isolated and where others are isolated, we need that reflection of Jesus' light. The early church worked, studied, and played together. People were attracted to Christ and, be, and the church because of the love that Acts 2 showed for all its members. Jesus' words in our reading this morning, I am the light of the world, are only going to have an effect on our community if we are willing to be that mirror that reflects the light of the divine Son of God into the, into the darkness of a lost world. And we can do that by sharing the love of God with those around us, by sharing the good news of Jesus to our friends and neighbors so they can experience the light, and by showing the world how God wants us to relate to each other, as the church did in Acts 2. Are we willing to be that mirror that will reflect Jesus to the world around us? Because when the light comes on, everything is better. Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals and sing that beautiful song that reminds us how God leads us, how God is our, sh our shepherd. Number 747, the Lord's my shepherd, Psalm 23. Just a reminder that everyone is welcome downstairs for a time of a good cup of coffee and being together in some good fellowship. And now receive this blessing. 
May God who comes to us in the things of this world bless our eyes and be in your seeing. May Christ who looks upon you with deepest love bless your eyes and widen your gaze. May the spirit who perceives what is and what yet may be bless your eyes and sharpen your vision. And may the sacred three bless your eyes and cause you to see. Amen.